give. I was hugely blessed this week. Uh, <clears throat> we've never, we take our kids to funerals. I watch the news all the time. I talk about the news with my children. We got one of those things where you can pause it, you know. And so I pause it and talk to the kids about what's going on. And and mom, my wife Yumi was talking to my little four-year-old Aaron about what happened out in Boston. And she said those two boys were brothers, and they didn't learn to love people. They didn't go to church. And when they didn't like people, they thought you're supposed to kill them. And Aaron thought that's not right. And uh, Yumi said, because Jesus told us to love everybody. And Aaron says, that's right. We're supposed to love our enemies. And mom said, how did you know that? He said, Papa's always saying it. <laughs> now I'm getting teared up. Well, our heavenly pop is always saying it to us, too. And so those two fellows that died, we're supposed to love them as well. Not the, I mean, the, uh, the one died and the one is uh, in, in a hospital right now, in the hospital. British people say in hospital. We're not British here. Uh, it's easy to love people that we understand. It's easy to love people that are like us. It's easy to love people that think like that us, have the same values as us. It's easy to love people that haven't just put a bomb in a crowd next to a bunch of innocent people. And yet Jesus Christ loves them so much that if they were the only two people on earth, he would have died for their sins and said, come to me, I love you, confess your sins, humble yourself before the Lord, and he would have opened heaven's doors for them. And I want to have love like that. And it has nothing to do with justice. Society demands justice. God put government in power to protect the citizenry, to have justice. But uh, there's a difference between vengeful, hateful justice and a justice that says, this is what needs to be done, and I hope you're right with the Lord. Amen? Imagine the contrast between the wasted life of those two brothers. And George Beverly Shea, and, and you get Cliff Barrows and Billy Graham, and living their life, and, and I heard his son, Franklin Graham, speak at a, at a conference Yumi and I went to, and he stood up there and he said, for the rest of my life, every drop of blood, every breath, every penny the Lord gives me, I'm going to use it to bring people to heaven. And I just, oh. that's, a, that's a life with purpose. I'm going to not waste my breath here. I'm going to try to get more people into heaven because of the way I live. Or I can got to stay alive at least till tomorrow so I can watch a rerun of Gilligan's Island. You know, I mean, what? What are we living for? George Beverly Shea knew what he was living for. Let's pray. And uh, today's message is called, Don't Worry, Be Happy. And I hear the song in my mind. Uh, it's amazing that we've been going step by step through the New Testament and this week's sermon, this week's text is perfect for what happened in the world this week. And it's the exact same text that we used in Sunday school class this morning out of a book that we've been just going through. And, and then Rachel's, uh, the song Rachel and Chet chose lined up perfectly. So everything, I'm guessing, Holy Spirit maybe thinks we have something to learn here this morning. Today's message, you often hear me say that the message is higher than the messenger. That what I'm saying, I know is true, uh, and I struggle to live up to today is a very challenging message for me. In fact, it's so challenging that I started not looking forward to it a few weeks ago, uh, except for the fact that it's awesome what God has to tell us, and I love God, and I love what he has to say, and, and I want to I wanna get it. I'm right here with all of us together. I want to get this message today. Let's pray. Oh, Lord, my God, you are great. I think about creation, the trillions and trillions of stars. I, 
I think about how every snowflake is different. Your Bible tells us that you know every hair on our head before and after we shampoo. You're aware of when a sparrow falls from a tree and dies, when a squirrel gets hit by a car. God, you're so great. We should just fall before you in tears, in terror, Lord, confessing our sins because of how good and perfect you and how messed up we are. And yet, God, you, you love us and you call us to you and you say you'll forgive everything. And Lord, how great you are when I, when I think about how your son Jesus Christ took responsibility for my messed up life, that he, he died on the cross for my sins. It's hard to even grasp that, God, why you would love me that much. Lord, I don't want to waste my life living for reruns on television. I don't want to waste my life just doing the same old thing day after day after day until I'm dead. Lord, I want to live my life for you. God, help me to love people really love people that are different than me. Help me, Lord, to, to learn how to forgive the way you forgive. Father, here we are this morning, and we say, please take our lives. They're yours. We give them to you. Do whatever you want, Father, and please use us. Love people through us. Show people that you're real through our church, Lord, and through each one of us. God, this morning... Uh, just ask that your Holy Spirit would act very powerfully in every person here. Lord, please act this morning. And help us to get this message. Help us to understand what you're trying to teach us this morning. Thank you, God, that you always listen to our prayers. Amen. In the... Uh, in the old days, when, when uh, Christ gave the Sermon on the Mount, people, often people would only have one set of clothes. You were either in your clothes or you were out of your clothes. And when they would wake up in the morning, you know, not, not people who had a, a good business or something, but a lot of people would wake up in the morning and they had to find work on a daily basis, find work for that day. They would wake up not knowing how they're going to get their meal. And imagine, that's hard that's rough if you're a single guy, but you get by. But what if you have a family? What if you have beautiful little children? You wake up in the morning and you think, I don't know how they're going to get fed today. It's still that way, you know, in some places in the world. It's awful hard. And, you know, it's still that way for some people right here in our country, the richest nation the world has ever seen. It's easy to worry when you have hardly anything. It's easy to worry. And it seems like having more things should be the answer. I mean, if you didn't have a bed, imagine you would think, oh, if I, if I had my own bed, and I could lay down in my own bed. I, imagine how you would you'd think that would answer everything. And then you have your own bed, and you lay down on your bed, and you worry Seems like you get stuff, and then you worry about your stuff. You don't have a house. You live in an apartment. Well, it's flooding. That's the owner's problem. Then you have your own house, and it rains, and you get a free in-ground swimming pool. And, and you start to worry about that. Or you worry about the red light that's been flashing in your car for a few months, and you're wondering what you're doing to your car. Uh you worry about your computers. Oh, what am I going to do? I need my computer. I think Linda broke John's monitor this week. Is that right? <laughs> That's kind of the story. I, I told it differently to make John in trouble. Uh, you worry about your, your furniture breaking. I mean, then you've got to replace it. Where does that come from? It seems like having more things gives us uh, potentially more things to fret about. If I were badly ill, if we were badly ill, we probably would worry 
about dying. If we're sick, we worry about it getting worse. I don't think I'm getting better. I feel like I'm getting worse. And when we're healthy, we can actually waste our healthy days, which we should be enjoying, worrying about when we're going to get sick or worrying when we're going to get that news from the, from the doctor. And then when you do get sick, you wonder, why didn't I enjoy those days when I could walk in the sunshine? Why didn't I spend more? Why, why did I walk around angry and tight and upset, wasting all those days before now? All I have is a series of sick days before the end. Why did I waste my life like that? And how about the news recently? The U.S. economy is in dire trouble. Smart people, smarter than me, think it's a mess. But you know what? We're better than Europe and we're better in Japan. Yes, until you think, wait a second, we're tied to their economies. In, in it, this, the news this week is Germany has tried to prop up this country after this country. Now they've just tried to prop up yet another country. Germany can't do that forever. And when they can't prop up Europe any longer, that's going to be like an anchor that pulls on us. Japan is, has had a similar economic problems to the United States, only multiplied. They've got an aging population. The amount of people who can pay into the system are decreasing. The amount of people who need to take from the system are increasing. And the government's solution is printing more money. Danger. Then there's Iran, which kind of enjoyed the news in Boston because they got off the front page. Of course, the week before, Korea had helped them get off, North Korea had helped them get off the front page. Uh, continuing to threaten world peace, and Iran saying, we want to wipe Jerusalem off the map. And by the way, they're continuing to develop the capability to produce nuclear weapons. Meanwhile, North Korea has been threatening war. And two weeks ago, they said, if we shoot a missile, in the United States, South Korea, Japan shoots it down, we're going to bathe 30 million citizens of Tokyo in fire. Now, it's rhetoric, and it's one of those things that shouldn't happen. Of course, World War I shouldn't have happened. You know, it's, it's one of those things that shouldn't happen. This doesn't make any sense. And yet, many wars in human history shouldn't have happened. They didn't make sense before they did. And then there was that tragic accident down in Texas at the fertilizer plant. Fertilizer, very dangerous. Uh, dozens of people missing, earthquakes in Iran and in China, big, big earthquakes. And those two crazed brothers we talked about out east who went on this killing spree and shut down the city of Boston. And every day, the local newspaper brings stories of flooding, tragic accidents like the one in Milton. Breaks my heart to think about that family. Reports of violence in Janesville, a guy with an ax hitting people, uh, crime. There's a problem here. Uh, the world's messed up, that's obvious. And if I'm honest with myself, I know I'm messed up because I can be pretty, pretty nasty and self-righteous and all these things sometimes. But there's a problem here if I if I look at the world too much, and worry starts to become the center of my thoughts. I think about my aunt and, and my friend and, and my friend's friend. I think about the people on the television. And pretty soon, my thoughts, which the Bible tells us should be centered around the Lord, my thoughts are all rotating around all of these problems. And I think, oh, man, oh, no, how can I deal with this? How? In, if our thoughts are filled up with worry, do you know that we cannot be enthralled with the Lord? And God wants us to be enthralled of Him. God wants us, it's like a couple in love. They're thinking about each other all the time. God says, my thoughts are full of you. I'm always thinking about you. And I want you to always think about me. God wants you to love Him. Oh yes, I love God. Sure, I love God. We just toss that out there so easy. I don't think men, I don't think our wives would appreciate us if we said, I love you like that, and then didn't think about them. And God's not an idiot. <laughs> I love you, Lord, and I don't have the time of day for you. I don't think about you. You're not in my thoughts. I make plans that don't include you. God knows what's up. If worry replaces God in the center of my heart, in my mind, in my soul, 
then I am spiritually out of alignment. Things are not the way they should be in my heart. He loves us and he wants us to love him. He wants to be the center of our attention. He wants our lives to actually orbit him. Think like God is our son. And our lives should orbit God. If we're not orbiting God, then we're just drifting in the universe. God gives purpose and meaning to our lives. Our thoughts, our feelings, everything should not be dominated by worry. If they are, it's a form of idolatry. It's kind of like it. Things can get pretty messed up in this world. Things can get very disheartening even on a beautiful spring day. And Jesus says, Jesus says, my daughter, my son, I'm paraphrasing here, don't fret. It's tight. Oh, my God. Oh. He says, no, don't do that. God sees. God is aware. Turn with, your, turn with me in your Bibles, please, to Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6 from verse 25. If you're using the Bible in front of you, Matthew chapter 6 is on one of those pages. Matthew chapter 6, 25 through 34. This is a continuation of the Sermon on the Mount. Remember, Jesus is sitting down. He's talking to this big group of people. He says, therefore, I tell you, do not worry about your life. Do not worry about your life, what you're going to eat or drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more important than food? And the body more important than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Can any one of you, by worrying, add a single hour to your life or Maybe your translation says a single inch to your height. And why do you worry about clothes? See how the flowers of the field grow? They do not labor or spin. Yet I tell you that even Solomon in all his, King Solomon in all the splendor of a king was not dressed like one of these flowers in this field. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, Will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith? It's a faith issue, isn't it? When we worry too much, it's a lack of faith. So do not worry, saying, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after these things, and your Heavenly Father knows that you need them. And then if you're one of those people that marks in your Bible, you can mark 33. But seek First, seek it. Go after it. Pursue it. Pursue his kingdom. Remember, he taught us how to pray. He says, our Father in heaven, your kingdom come. The kingdom of God, God's rule in my heart, in my life. Seek first his kingdom. And his righteousness means put God's rightness first. Not what I think is right, but what God says is right. We talked this morning in, in, in our Sunday school class if you don't have the book, you need to get the book. It's right back there on the, on the counter. Chapter 6, we just studied about it. The king Jeroboam was looking at his situation. He ruled in the north, and the kingdom in the south had the temple in Jerusalem. He didn't want people to go down to the temple, so he built false idols. He thought within himself, if the people go down to Jerusalem, they're going to abandon me. So he built a couple statues of calves in the north and the south. He told people, this is more convenient. You don't want to go all the way down there. Religion should always be convenient, right? <laughs> and, and, so, and so he set up these false idols because he thought he knew better than God. God says, go to the temple. He says, no, I think I've got a different plan. Brothers and sisters, God has his will for your life and my life. He has his righteousness, his, what he says is right, what is good. And we have our own opinions about what is right. Well, I, I think church is cool, but I've got to work. Or I think church is cool, but you don't know. I don't have much family time. 
and I never watch television because I want to spend every moment with my wife and kids. And so we think we know, instead we think, you know, like family time means my family together in the church worshiping God? No, that's not quite it. I think family time is going to look so, something different. We think we know what's right. Brothers, sisters, Jesus says, don't worry, but seek first his kingdom, his will, his righteousness, and then all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow. Because really, tomorrow has enough to worry about. Each day has enough trouble of its own. Christ gives us several reasons not to get wacky, not to stress out. You ever notice when you start to stress, you freak out? When, when, when there's a panic, tense situation, the worst thing you can do is start stressing because that's when you crash your car, that's when you, you get tight and you lock up. Uh, and our brains can lock up. In, and Jesus says, don't stress over your needs. And he gives us several reasons. Number one, life is more than food or clothes. God, we, we really need this. We need this. We need this. Guys, God says, you know, life is more than gasoline in your gas tank. God, but we really need to get so tight. And God's, and God's saying, no, you're missing life because you're stressing over something else. And life is more important than the thing you're stressing about. And then two, Jesus says, look at nature. God can take care of that. Don't you think he could take care of you? Oh, wow. Number three, worrying can't make you an inch taller or your life a minute longer. Worrying doesn't help, so what's the use of it? That's kind of real practical. And, and by the way, uh, medical science tells us that worrying will actually decrease your lifespan. I don't know if it makes you shorter or not. But, but worrying can have such a negative effect. So first, God tells us life is more than the things you worry about. And then he says, look at I'm taking care of all creation. I can take care of you. Then thirdly, he says, and by the way, your worrying doesn't improve your life in the least. Number four, then Christ tells us that the things we think we need can't compare to the glory that God gives even the grass. And he gives glory to us too. And there's a glory, if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, there's a glory within you. And one of the things that will keep that from being unlocked will be if we are wrapped up in worry and pressure and concerns and tightness. In other words, you can't be the glorious person God made you to be if you're freaking out all the time. God is going to make something good out of your life. God is going to make something beautiful out of your life. You can be a blessing to the people around you, but not if you're always so tight and wrapped up in what we don't have or what we wish was different. We can waste a whole lifetime waiting for things to get better instead of learning how to enjoy and appreciate where we're at right now. What a tragic waste of a life. Again, contrast that to a life well lived in Jesus Christ. I don't want to waste my life. Remember I said life is short. Why would we waste it arguing with our wives or our husbands or holding grudges? It's the same with worry. Every moment spent stressing out over worry is a moment that you could be rejoicing and walking in the sun of our Lord. I want to enjoy my walk here with the Lord. Now, I'm not saying that I just need to have fun, I need to be happy, I need to be happy, that's the only thing that counts. No, I'm saying in the middle of hardship, in the middle of bad news, I want to say I've got a good God and I've got this Bible, and I've got a church, and I want to learn how to hold on to the things that are important in the middle of the difficulty so I can still find cause to rejoice in the Lord even when everything else is going down. That was a flush sign. <laughs> Provide your own mental imagery. The fifth thing Jesus says, he said, you know, people without faith in me worry about these things. 
it's nothing special to worry about illness and money and relationships. You don't need faith to worry about that. Gentiles or pagans, maybe your translation says, people without faith in God know how to worry about these things. So what does it mean when you say you trust me? What is faith? Why should people who have faith act like the people who don't have faith? Does that even make any sense? Number six, we can have confidence. Confidence is a good deterrent against fear and worry. We can have confidence that we have a Father in heaven who already knows what we need. We talk about having faith like a child. Having faith like a child doesn't mean uh, you're stupid and you believe anything. Having faith in a child is like, I look at my dad and I'm safe when I'm with dad. That dog looks scary, but dad's here. It's storming outside, but dad's here. Having faith like a child, we can have confidence that we have a father in heaven that already knows what we're stressing about. Maybe God doesn't know, maybe God doesn't see. No, he already knows and he already sees. Our papa, our heavenly father, Abba, already sees the situation we're in. He knows the situation we're in. He loves us. And then seven, the last reason Jesus gives us so that we're not consumed by fears and consumed by worry. Think about that imagery. My life is consumed. It's just eaten up by fear and worry. All, all I'm left is a bundle of, bundle of fears and nerves and worry. And Jesus says we should not be so filled with worry. What we should be concerned about is obeying God seeking to be good and seeking God's will to be done in our own lives so that we're filled up with, with this attitude, I'm going to follow God. Here's my life. I'm going to plant my flag on this hill. Nobody's going to move me. I'm standing with Jesus Christ. I'm standing with God's people. I'm standing on the word of God. And that's where my life is. My life is filled up with Jesus, so it can't be filled up with worry. <coughs> right now, I'm worried my voice is leaving. <coughs> Excuse me. So what are we going to be filled with? Well, I could be filled up with worrying about everything, holding on to grudges, being bitter, pouting, feeling sorry for myself. Yeah, that sounds like a good way to live my life. Or, you know, this, what's behind door number one? Well, wasted life. And look at door number two. Oh, learning how to love, learning how to forgive, having more patience, kindness, God's righteousness, God's will, God's way. I don't know. Dormer number one looks awful attractive. And the people in the crowd are saying, choose, you know, whatever they think. Maybe if you're hanging out with the wrong crowd, they're saying, get away from door number two. Don't listen to God. Choose the life of worry and emptiness and meaninglessness. It's awful good, you know? And, and we go back and forth. I want to I wanna be so filled up. Uh, I remember in high school thinking that there's so many things that I can be afraid of in life. But I want to be so afraid of God. I want to fear God so much that there's no room left to fear anything else. You know, I've not been successful at that. Uh... For whatever reason, and it's ridiculous, and I've got Brother Frank who I respect, and I'm afraid of flying. Does that make any sense at all? I mean, logically, I know that it's perfectly safe. I know that the ride to the airport, I'm much more likely to die than when I get on the airplane. And by the way, when I get on airplanes, I'm normally fine. But for some reason, the days before it, the build up, I, I kind of get dizzy and all these different things. And I've flown lots, and I'll, I will continue to fly when I need to. So it's not like it stops me, but why do I fret about it? It doesn't make any sense to me. But my, in, my, my intent, my desire in this life is to fear nothing but the Lord. I, I want to I, I say, God, your way is best. But Jesus doesn't stop there. He tells us, that if we do put the things of God first, 
then all the things we need will be given to us as well. So then we got to think, well, am I putting God first in my life? Well, not really. I think this is true in at least three ways. Number one, if we seek God's kingdom and his righteousness, God will actively bless us so that we can accomplish his things. We want to build the kingdom of God. We want to grow in righteousness. God will bless us in order to accomplish these things. And we saw in yesterday's, or was it two days ago? I don't know. Uh, in Faith Walkers, may God be gracious to us and bless us and make his face shine upon us that God that your ways may be known on earth. God, be gracious to me, bless me, so that your ways will be known on earth, that your salvation will be known among the nations. That's Psalm 67, 1 and 2. Secondly, uh, it could be taught that these verses are talking about things that are, are incidentally included. Some scholars teach it this is incidentally included, and I, I kind of have always felt this way about this. For example, what does it mean, incidentally included? You seek God's will first, and by the way, you get these other things. If you put your focus on these other things, then you miss out on those, and you miss out on the Lord as well. But what's incidentally? It means like you buy groceries, and bonus, you get a free plastic bag. Or, or, or paper, if you prefer. Uh, you buy a drink at McDonald's, and they don't just give you the liquid. They give you a cup, and they give you a lid, and they give you a straw. These are things that are incidental. In other words, seek God first. I'm going to put God first in my life. And guess what? A better quality of life incidentally follows. And that's been shown around the world where Christianity goes into a culture, the standard of living usually rises. Things get better. Seek God first. And instead of fretting about life, suddenly life is getting better. I'm not saying, this is not magic. I'm not, don't, don't put in magic here. You know, whatever you got going. Don't put magic in there and think, now I'm going to get a good guy. I'm get. How, many, how, how many times do I got to read my Bible before I get blessings? <laughs> he says, seek first God. And when you're living to put God first, guess what? You're going to stress out about, I need, I need, I need. I'm worried, I'm worried, I'm worried. Life gets better. And the third way in which these verses are true, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness uh, and all these things will be given to you. Uh, in the life to come, in the life to come in heaven, if we put God first in this life, paradise is open for us. Brothers and sisters, do you know why this world seems messed up to you? Do you feel why, man, things are not the way they should be? Because things are not the way they should be. We saw right there in the beginning of the book of Genesis, God made animals and there was land. God made fish and there was sea. God made birds and there was sky. And God made Adam and Eve and where did he put them? In paradise, in the garden of Eden. You and I, we weren't meant for a messed up world. That's why it doesn't feel right. We were meant for a paradise. We were created to be in a place where things are right, where people treat each other decently, where, 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 the, where there is no sin and selfishness and, and, and greed and all of these things. And in the life to come, if you put God first in this life, you will go to heaven. And God will blow us away with love and blessings. We will certainly be recompensed for all that we have to give up for Christ now. Luke 18, 29, Jesus says, truly I say to you, Jesus says, truly I say to you, I don't know if I can trust him. I, I can trust the, the uh, newscaster over at ESPN, but Jesus, I don't know. Uh, Jesus says, the guy who died for us on the cross, truly I say to you, there was no one, there's nobody who had to leave their home, or their wife or their brothers, their parents or children, because they were following the kingdom of God. In other words, they put God first and their family didn't follow him. There's nobody who, who, who their friends turned against them and said, what's wrong with you? You're becoming a Christian now? And Jesus says, there's nobody who had to leave things who will not receive many times as much in the age to come eternal life. In other words, if we do have to suffer a little bit now because people don't understand this Jesus thing, Jesus says it's going to be okay. I'm going to give you way more than you could possibly give up now. It's also comforting to me. Think about this. We just read this in the Bible. Isn't it cool that God gave us a Bible and said, hey, by the way, I know you guys worry a lot, and so here, have this. 
God, the fact that we worry, God takes it seriously. That's why he says, come on, guys, don't worry. And here's, here's seven reasons why you shouldn't have to worry. God is basically telling us, come on, there now. It's okay. I know. I know you're worried about this or that, but, you know, you don't have to be. I'm here. Daddy's here. I see what you're going through, and, and you don't know it, but I see the end of your story. It's going to be okay. How can you say it's going to be okay? The do- I've got this serious illness, doctors. You, you know, the second you step into paradise, you're going to know what I mean. It's going to be okay. It's going to be okay. God, God, who made the universe and died for my sin, is right here telling us, come on, don't waste your life fretting and worrying, because it will be okay. It's going to work out. God wants us to know this, and that's why this passage is in the Bible. Isn't it kind of neat that God loved us enough, God loved me enough, God loved you enough to put these words in here for us so we could read this? Oh, yeah, my life's been so out of whack because I've been freaking out and worried about so many things. I've been getting tension and stress and, and worried about, and no, I don't have to. And God, you're calling me not to waste my life worrying about all these things, all those empty days misused days it's comforting to know that god loves me that much and there's brothers and sisters there's two common errors i make them there's two common errors that we can commit here one is to fret and worry and miss out on joy and peace of mind that comes from resting in the goodness of god's sovereignty god is good god gives good blessings we can trust him he's a god is a good listener We don't always listen to what God has to say, but when we turn to him, confess our sins, and pray, he's always listening. God's a good listener. He graciously hears our prayers. If we're always complaining, always worrying, always tight, when you're tight, we don't let God in, right? And upset about something, we are not living in faith. We're living in the flesh. There's no peace in the flesh. There's no joy in the flesh. So that's one error. The second error that we can fall into, and this can also ruin our lives, is is to be lazy. You know, laziness can ruin your life. We don't push ourselves to do things that we don't that that we know need to be done, uh, but we really don't want to do them. And you you know you can make that look spiritual. Well, I have to do this. But I'm just going to let the Lord take care of it because I have faith. And so I'm not going to wear a seatbelt. I'm not going to put on a helmet because I just have faith. I'm not going to pay my bills because I just have faith. I'm not going to go to work because I just have faith. And I'm that, I'm that spiritual. I don't even have to go to work to get my bills paid. Deny myself? No, I want that. I'm not going to deny myself. I need that. I need this. I need, I need that over there, too. And, and I need your stuff. And so we, 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 don't, we don't know how to tell no to ourselves. No, Dan, you can't have that because you don't have the money for that. No, you can't have that because that belongs to somebody else, and you can't take other people's stuff. We don't know how to, we're lazy, and we don't know how to say no to ourselves. Instead, we just kick back and say, the Lord. You can make it sound so spiritual, so holy. We pat ourselves on the back for being super spiritual. In reality, we just don't want to do what needs to be done. We don't want to use our mind that God gave us. We don't want to deny our flesh. I don't worry. I don't fret. And God says, you know what? That's because you don't care. <laughs> I, don't, I don't worry about my friends or family. I'm spiritual. No, like I said, God says, you don't worry about your friends and family because you don't have an ounce of love in there for you. You're so wrapped up in doing your own thing, you don't have time to worry about anybody else. Well, I wanted to make, this, make me look better in all this, God. You know. So you see, there's two errors. One is worrying too much, and the other one is just totally not giving a rip and then thinking it's because I'm spiritual. Everybody tracking? You see how we can fall into those? 
I know I can. People are sitting here thinking right now, boy, Pastor, you're really bad. I think I'm not the only one. I really, really think this is common to all people. Neither one of these things is being obedient to God. Neither one of them is being a good person. It's selfishness. Selfishness. Com pouting, complaining, worrying all the time is wrapped up in self. Not pouting and complaining and worrying because you don't care about anything because the only thing you care about yourself is wrapped up in self. Like so often, you know when we're trying to live for Jesus, it's called the straight and narrow for a reason. We've got to walk right down the center. In so much of Christianity, you go a little bit to this side or a little bit to that side, you fall off. And pretty soon, you're not following God. You're not following the straight path. You're just going your own way. We fall into error. We fall into disobedience. The Adam Clark commentary, and I'm almost done now, it's just so beautiful. It explains this perfectly. The language is a little old, but please listen. Prudent care. Prudent care, that means common sense, doing the right thing and the things we need to do, is never forbidden by our Lord. Okay? Hello? Prudent care is never forbidden by our Lord, but only that anxious, distracting solicitude which by dividing the mind and drawing it in different ways renders it utterly incapable of intending to any solemn or important concern. In other words, God's not saying don't make, don't prepare for the future, don't, don't, don't work hard, don't get the things done. He's saying, God's saying don't get freaked out by the things you're worrying about. He's not saying don't go to work, don't put money away for a rainy day. He's not saying any of that. He's saying don't be wrapped up in worry. It's, it's more simple than we're making it. Oh, Jesus said, don't worry about tomorrow. That means I don't have to prepare. No, that's not what he's saying. He's saying, don't worry about tomorrow. Uh, Adam Clark commentary going on says, to be anxiously careful concerning the means of substance is to lose all satisfaction, to lose all comfort in the things which God gives. We're not satisfied. We're not comf com we don't feel comfort. We have no peace lack of faith. One way to think of all this is, uh, I don't know what I was thinking. Everybody's going to think of something else now. Uh, my illustration is carrying heavy backpacks, but it has nothing to do with what happened in, in Boston. Uh, each one of us is carrying this heavy backpack, this heavy knapsack, this weight. And inside this backpack, and you carry it, it is all the guilt of our sins, all the nasty things we said, we did, we thought. It's a weight of accusations because we don't measure up to what society expects. People look down at us and we carry that weight. We don't feel like we fit in, we carry that weight. We don't match even our own standards. I want to be this kind of person and I'm not even living up to that. I'm awful hard on other people if they don't do this, but I've done it myself. And we certainly, certainly do not match up to God's perfect standards. God demands perfection, we fall short. That means we go to hell unless we take forgiveness, right? We better grab a hold of the grace God gives. So we're carrying around this, this heavy, heavy weight, and we're also carrying regret for choices. Man, I made some bad mistakes in my life. Bad choices and not carrying around this regret. And even though we're, even, maybe that wasn't necessarily sinful, but it was kind of stupid, and, and maybe it was kind of sinful, and we regret it. We're carrying around memories of times when we've been embarrassed. That wasn't maybe sinful, but, you know, you peed your pants or something, and, and that's embarrassing. You just, man, you carry around that weight. Or, or dreams that went down in flames. I always thought my life was going to be about, man, I thought I was going to be the next American Idol. You are the next American I could even say it, you know, and, and then you're not. And uh, all these dreams, and, and all this is life, and it weighs down. It's heavy. All these fears, all these worries, doubts about the future. We worry for ourselves. We worry for our family, our kids. We worry for our parents. We worry for our friends. We worry for our nation. We worry for our church. And even though we know God created us to enjoy life with him, we end up missing it all because we worry too much. And the backpack is too heavy. Brothers and sisters, 
we've got to put down that backpack. <laughs> it's time to take our burdens and bring them to the cross. Set them down at the foot of the cross and believe that we have a big God who's bigger than our problems. We need to stop lugging all of this around and start trusting. Lord God, this is the day you've made. I'm going to rejoice in this. God, I don't want to waste a single moment of my life wrapped up in all of these things which are distracting me from you. God, you're good. I know you love me. I want to love you, and I want to start learning to love other people too. I want to trust you, God, because it seems like if I, t- start, if I tell people I'm a Christian, I'm going to lose some friends, or I might lose some hours at work if I start living for you. People might be upset. My family's not going to understand it. I want to stop living my love control. I feel what people think and start living my love and start living for the Lord. This is God do our charity that we decide to live like the Lord instead of all these others that connect us and worry us and bind us up. We have the example this week of two brothers who wasted their lives and took down the people around them. We have the example of George Beverly Shea, who lived his life for the Lord, and today millions of people, instead of taking people down with him, he took people up with him. Today millions of people have their citizenship in heaven because he gave his life to serve the Lord. What are we going to do? Door one, door two. Brothers and sisters, choose door two. Choose door two. There's nothing for us over here. The devil's a liar. There's no joy. There's no peace. There's no hope there. Choose door two. Let's pray. Lord God, Father, I want to choose you. Not my way, Lord. Not my messed up path. Your way, God. Father, I want to live for goodness and truth love and beauty, forgiveness, joy, peace, everything good, Lord, that comes from you. Help me to set aside all the things that can bind us and wrap us up and drag us down, all the fears and worries and concerns that, that Lord, when, we, when we're filled up with these things, it doesn't do one positive thing for us. It doesn't add an inch to our height. It doesn't add one single moment to our lives, Lord. Instead, Father, we want to give our hearts to you completely and follow after you each and every day, saying that, God, your ways are better than our ways. We're not smarter than you. We want to do things your way. Thank you, God, for your love. Thank you, God, for the cross where your son, Jesus Christ, died to take responsibility for my messed up lives, my sin. God, thank you that Jesus rose again so we can have this promise that we put our faith in you, we will rise again too and be with you in heaven. God, thank you for being good and patient when we've been so selfish. Please forgive us, Lord. Help us to live for you. We pray this in your name. Amen. Foundation Bible Church, inconveniently located two blocks northwest of the Janesville Athletic Club.